We now go on to another phenomenon, the fountain effect. What you see here is a tube which narrows down and then opens into a bulb. A small piece of cotton is stuffed into the constriction between the tube and the bulb. And the bulb has been tightly packed with one of the finest powders available, jeweler's rouge. A second wad of cotton keeps the powder in the bulb. This powder presents extremely fine capillary channels. Their average diameter is a small fraction of one micron. This device has been placed in the door. The liquid helium is below the lambda point. We submerge the bulb and then we'll send a beam of light from this lamp to a point near the top. You will see the light beam when the lamp is turned on. It focuses some heat in the form of infrared radiation on the point in question. The temperature will rise above the temperature of the rest of the apparatus. Let us turn it on. Liquid helium flows through the hole in the bottom of the bulb, through the fine powder, and rises above the level of liquid helium outside. The height to which it will go depends on the temperature increase produced by the lamp focused on the bulb. We can very well ask, where does the mechanical energy come from that does the work necessary to pump the liquid above the ambient level? Before we attempt to discuss this question, there are two other facts that should be noted. The first is by now obvious. The upward flow through the bulb must clearly be a superflow. Only the superfluid component of helium-2 could get through. The second fact is more significant. Let me explain it this way. The superfluid flows spontaneously from A to B, from a cooler to a warmer place. Point A is in the cold liquid, but B is being heated with infrared rays. The second law of thermodynamics positively says that heat cannot of itself flow from a point of lower to a point of higher temperature. What does this mean to us here, knowing, as we do, that the superfluid is flowing from a colder to a warmer spot? Simply this, it carries no heat, no thermal energy. Any internal energy it may still possess is no longer thermally available. To say it precisely, it has zero entropy. We have discovered another remarkable property of helium-2. Its superfluid component not only is friction-free, it also contains no heat. The heat energy contained in helium-2 as a whole resides, all of it, in the normal component. We may, of course, add heat to the superfluid component, as we are doing when it passes the spot heated by the lamp. But in doing so, we are converting it into the normal component.